thank you very much. Uh, it's really a profound pleasure and honor to be here in this celebration of my favorite structure, the nucleosome. And uh, I was actually counting on Tim and Daniela to give um, a historical perspective of the structure determination of the eukaryotic nucleosome. And so I thought what I would do is give you an evolutionary perspective into how these structures came to be. And I'll share with you uh, the wild and wonderful things that we discovered when we analyzed uh, histones and what they do in all domains of life, not just in eukaryotes. Now, uh, before I start, I, I have to confess that I actually did and join Tim's lab to, to study nucleosomes or chromatin. In fact, coming from a background in enzymology and protein engineering, I thought they were quite boring. They didn't really do anything. I just wanted to learn crystallography. And more, um, more pertinently, I wanted to learn how you get from these beautiful diffraction patterns to even more beautiful three-dimensional structures. And little did I know that the project that I was offered to learn uh, this approach uh, was among probably the top five hardest projects in structural biology. Now, um, um, through the persistence and grit and uh, sweat of, of all the authors uh, on this publication, about eight years later, we could call it mission accomplished. And you heard a lot of the history uh, from Daniela and from Tim. But I do want to give a huge shout out to my partners in crime that were not uh, authors on this, on this paper. Song Tan, Thomas Recksteiner, Yvonne Hunziker, and Andrew Flaws, all good friends who supported me through eight very, very difficult years. Um, my, my own contribution to this very hard problem is actually um, I, I took a little podcast on this wonderful site that I want to draw your attention to. All educators and students should log into iBioc China. It's a free of charge public domain um, website that has fabulous talks by all kinds of very famous people, some of which are probably in this room already. Um, and so you can hear all the gory details about uh, how we did these, um, how we managed to uh, overcome a lot of the fundamental difficulties in this. Um, and I think it just came online very, very recently. I've been told by iBio. Uh, they also have really beautiful fundamental experiments explained by Tom Check and other laureates. And so you guys should all check it out. Now, um, the structure of the nucleosome, and you've heard a lot about it, is, is just um, captures people's attention, not because of its sheer beauty, but also because it really beautifully explains a lot of the biology that, um, that a lot of the nuclear biology. And uh, by means of introduction, and then I'll move on to, to prokaryotes and, and other organisms. Uh, uh, as you all know, the entire genome is organized by nucleosomes. So, so this is indeed how the genomic DNA is organized. And because the DNA is so tightly contorted and wrapped around the histones, it profoundly affects the, term, uh, the, the temporal and spatial access to the genome. Transcription, replication, DNA repair, and anybody who requires access to the DNA requires very complex machinery. And we've heard a little bit about this from, from Tim and Daniela. And uh, they are the targets of epigenetic controls, meaning that um, post-translational modifications put on the histone tails, as Tim uh, outlined, have very profound biological implications that we now understand because we understand uh, the structure. And invariably, this holds true for all eukaryotes. Now, since starting my, my own lab, um, a large number of years ago now, um, we've kind of stayed pretty close to nucleosomes and chromatin. And we currently have three main areas of research. First, we study regulators of genome accessibilities, most recently histone chaperones and ATP-dependent remodelers. And I want to share with you two brief vignettes uh, done by former postdocs in the lab who are now faculty at Hong Kong University and who are here somewhere in this room. Um, I will then spend the majority of my remaining time on the evolutionary origins of nucleosomes. And I'll guide you down the path of what happens when you look for histones in all the wrong places and the very strange um, structural properties that these 
proteins have. We also have a very active research program on PARP and DNA damage repair. PARP is a cancer drug target, and we're working hard on drug designs and interactions and inhibition of this enzyme. I will not have time to talk to you about this today. So um, to, to paraphrase Roger Kornberg, when an RNA or DNA polymerase meets a nucleosome, something has to give. Irresistible force meets an immovable object. In particular, what has to happen is when a motor impinges on chromatinized DNA, histones have to be first evicted disassembled. Uh, the evicted histones are very, very positively charged, and as such, they have to be chaperoned, pretty much like at a high school dance, to prevent improper interaction between DNA, RNA, and histones. Um, and then they have to be reassembled in the wake of the polymerase in order to maintain chromatin uh, structure and the repressive nature of chromatin. And finally, these partial nucleosomes that are maybe left in the wake of the polymerase or ahead of the polymerase, the hexasomes, somehow have to be stabilized. Now, there's many factors that participate in this, but one factor that invariably shows up in every single cartoon describing all of these processes is the histone chaperone called FACT that we renamed for facilitates all chromatin transactions. This factor has been known for a very long time, but we had no idea how it engages chromatin and how it performs its many diverse functions. And it was Keda Zhao and Yang Lu, who are both here, who, who managed through a heroic effort in cryo-EM and biochemistry to catch fact in the act of manipulating a nucleosome. What they could show by cryo-EM is that this protein sits astride a partial nucleosome uh, using a rather extensive DNA binding interaction interface and then uses an acidically charged C-terminal tail to pr that pretends to be DNA and that hugs the histone dimers to the body of the nucleosome while the DNA is being worked on by a polymerase. Through some very elegant biochemistry, they also managed to figure out how this protein is auto-inhibited to actually make it only bind to uh, partial nucleosomes and not to intact chromatin. Uh, and this work has been published, and uh, you guys can all read up on this or ask Cody and Young, who are sitting right here, if you have any further questions. Um, Cody was also the brave person in my lab who brought us into the resolution, resolu uh, resolution in cryo-EM. He was the first person to determine a cryo-EM structure in my lab. Uh, these are some uh, original images, and he managed to determine a 2.6 angstrom cryo-EM structure of a centromeric nucleosome bound to its decoding protein. And so I don't want to get in the science here. I just want to show you that um, this was actually done, is now being done uh, thanks to Cody's hard work in pretty record time by second, third year graduate students. We, uh, we achieve astounding resolution. And as you remember, all the hard work we had to put in to determine structures to 2.8 angstroms or even a little higher. Um, this has really been uh, a game changer for structural biology. And we're really having a lot of fun with this approach. Now, uh, Cody could also show that uh, these centromere binding proteins form a very specific type of chromatin higher order structure. And if you're interested uh, uh, in this further, you can read Cody's paper or talk to him in person. Um, what I'm a microbiologist by training, and I've always been a little bothered by our almost exclusive focus on eukaryotes, which is, and, and, and actually humans, which is a very, very small and exclusive branch of vast life on Earth. It turns out that the ability to organize DNA with four histones and then the very elaborate chromatin processing machinery is very highly conserved across all eukaryotes. And so this means that um, a very low eukaryote, for example, Giardia lamblia, yeast, and my third favorite human being, Roger Fed all share the same machinery, the same apparatus uh, in organizing their genomes. So this must have been a very, very early acquisition on our path to becoming eukaryotes and indeed multicellular organisms. And um, this really the, ra raised the question of who provided the chromatin starter kit. Giardia 
is a very complex organism already, and he has everything that we have in terms of chromatin maintenance machinery. So in order to study this, uh, we, um, we um, started to investigate whether there were histones in domains of life that arguably contributed to forming the first uh, eukaryotic ancestor. And I'll tell you three little stories today. One, what we found in viruses, in archaea, and in bacteria. And we're going down this rabbit hole. We're going from pretty normal to rather strange to completely weird in bacteria. So let's start with viruses, in particular, giant viruses. Now, you might say the last thing we need is a virus, let alone a giant virus. These things exclusively um, infect aquatic um, organisms, amoeba mostly, but they're very, very interesting and they were only discovered very recently because they're very large and they didn't pass the filtration test that viruses normally have to pass through. Um, they also have large double-stranded DNA genomes and they're considered to be very deep branching in the tree of life. Um, one particular virus or family of viruses uh, caught our attention, and those were the, is the Melbourne virus and related organisms. They replicate exclusively in the amoeba cytoplasm, and they encode their own histones. So this really uh, piqued our attention, and um, in particular because these histones are fused as doublets. So histone H4 is fused to histone H3, histone H2B is fused to histone H2A. Overall, they're also very, um, very badly conserved, only 22% conservation uh, for H, uh, to H4, H3, and about 27% for the other two histones. And this for histones, which are the, amongst the most conserved proteins known to man, is a pretty astonishingly low, low number. So we asked uh, the question, can they bind DNA? Can they form nucleosomes? If yes, what properties do they have? Where and how they, are they assembled? And does the virus need these histones? And if yes, what for? This was a very enjoyable collaboration with Chantal Abershell's lab, and again, two known faces here, uh, Cody and Young, together with Chelsea Toner, who did this uh, really beautiful work. Now, um, Young, uh, with Cody's help, managed to determine the the cryo-AM structure of, Mel of these Melbourne virus nucleosomes. And uh, what you could found, find by, by and large is they resemble eukaryotic nucleosomes. I don't want to go into the details. They are quite destabilized. The DNA is a little bit splayed apart, so they had to employ all kinds of tricks uh, to, to maintain them in stabilized form on the cryo-AM grid. This overall structure, as I said, resembles that of the eukaryotic nucleosomes with uh, with details I don't want to bore you with, but the tails on connectors that actually connect the two histones have profoundly different roles here. They have structural roles rather than serving as the targets of epigenetic modifications. They're shown here in space filling form, and so they help stabilize the structure rather than serving uh, to be acetylated and signaling for signaling functions. Overall, these histones have fewer positive charges, and they also have a very distinct uh, surface, which implies that they might pack differently against each other to form the very compact, the higher order structure in viral chromatin. They do, however, as Tim pointed out, have the acidic patch, so this seems to be really a histone thing that all histones have, so they have maintained this. We don't quite know yet what they use it for. Now, uh, are these histones essential? And to investigate this, I need to explain a little bit about this infection cycle of this virus. So this virus is very large because it pretends to be a bacterium. Amoeba love to eat bacteria, so that's a really insidious way to get into the virus and infect it. As soon as it is inside the amoeba, it establishes a so-called viral factory, a membrane-less organelle where massive amounts of DNA are being made. Histones are being transcribed and translated, and rather than going to the nucleus as a normal histone would, they actually get recruited back to the viral factory where they are assembled into virus capsid through unknown 
own um, mechanisms. Uh, the viral progeny then bursts the host cell. The amoeba dies a horrible death, and the virus goes out to seek more amoeba to be eaten by, and then in turn eat it. Um, we could show the localization of these viral histones by using GFP tagged um, viral histones, and uh, we could see that immediately after infection of the, of the, with the virus and upon establishment of the viral factory, they pounce on the viral factory where, where they are presumably attracted to due to the massive amounts of DNA that this virus is making. Uh, I won't show you the genetics to, to, uh, by which we proved that um, these histones are essential for viral infectivity, but if you generate a knockout virus without the histones, you get no infectious virus whatsoever. But you can complement this by, by adding on transiently transfected viral histones uh, to the cell. Uh, that's how you can then get the mutant virus. And this was work done um, in Chantal Aubergel's lab in France. So we have a lot of answers, but we also have a lot of additional questions. So I've shown you that these, these histones form nucleosomes with very distinct structural features. This is a first in any virus, in actually in any domain outside of eukaryotes. They localize to the viral factory, they're very abundant in the virus, and they are required for viral fitness and infectivity. But why and where, we have no idea. Uh, on a broader picture, I think these are really fascinating systems to study chromatin because viruses by their nature are very, very streamlined. They do things in a very efficient way. And so we're having a lot of fun investigating how these histones structure the DNA in the virus. We're attempting tomography. How and when are they assembled or disassembled? And I want to point out that these are fascinating organisms because about 60% of this viral genome is dark, meaning that they encode open reading frames for completely unknown function proteins. Um, so it's quite likely that we'll find some interesting uh, things there. And then uh, we're also intrigued in, in, in investigating how widespread and diverse these histones are in giant viruses and where did they come from. And to this end, uh, we are actually really busy looking in metagenomes of giant viruses that have been dug up from permafrost in Siberia. And so there's a lot of new viruses, giant viruses that are being discovered through metagenomics um, and, and arguably these are ancient in the evolutionary history so we don't know what we'll find maybe we'll find a new zombie virus with histones and my students are really uh, interested in these kinds of projects for obvious reasons now um, histones are not very widespread in the in the viral uh, in the viral universe, and we don't really know who gave what to whom, but it's actually pretty established that the entire domain of archaea encodes minimalist histones that do not have histone tails, that do not have these extensions, and arguably it is those archaeal histones that were the precursors to eukaryotic histones. So. Um, a while ago, um, we determined the crystal structure of, of one such archaeal histone bound to DNA. This was work done by Sudipta Bhattacharya and Frama Tiroli. And what you can see here, this histone dimer to the left um, is very, very similar, this archaeal histone, very, very similar to the eukaryotic counterparts. And in fact, when you dig down at the protein-DNA interaction interfaces, those are very, very similar, in especially uh, kind of blew me away in, in light of the fact that there's three billion years of evolution between those two domains of life. They overall have about 40% amino acid sequence similarity, but the molecular detail, how the DNA is bent into shape, um, is extremely similar. As is the ability of these histones to form tetramers, to join together via these four helix bundle structures. And so from that, it's not that surprising that they actually form structures that are nucleus like and very, very surprisingly similar to the eukaryotic nucleosome with just a single histone protein. However, unlike eukaryotic nucleosomes that form defined particles, these things just keep going and they make what we call hypernucleosomes of variable length. They wrap stacks, uh, they, they, they form stacks and they just keep going around and around. Um, and we can go into the details of why that is, the structural details of why that is, if anybody's interested. Not now. For now, I just want to 
bring up the question, do these hypernucleosomes exist in solution and in the cell? And as you'll, um, as, as, as you'll appreciate, uh, when you do crystallography, you're always uh, subject to the attack of crystal artifacts. And so Sam Bowerman in my lab set out to check whether these things actually exist, uh, look like this on longer pieces of DNA. And so he determined the cryam structure of hypernucleosomes on 207 base pairs of DNA. These were some of our first images. They're, they're not that great in terms of resolution, but they did the job because what he surprisingly found in these uh, 2D reconstructions, he found uh, a good number of hypernucleosomes, nucleosomes where the DNA just keeps wrapping, as we would have predicted. But then he also found these open book kind of nucleosomes that we were very interested in. He then went on to determine um, the low resolution structure envelopes of these open nucleosomes and also the closed ones um, and fit a model into this. And, and indeed, you can see that we form a nucleosome with about um, eight histones, so it looks like a normal eukaryotic nucleosome, and then the additional histones just kind of flop open and bind the remainder of the DNA in a very, very smooth structural transition. Um, and, and this result really beautifully explained uh, an observation that we made in the archaeal cell uh, that we couldn't explain to date, and that is that when you take archaeal chromatin and you digest it with an enzyme that can only bite unprotected DNA, you get a very regular 30 base pair pattern. And this is very consistent with a stochastically opening DNA uh, uh, hypernucleosome structure where stochastically the micrococcal nucleus can just bite in various areas and digest it in various areas. And this digestion pattern, I will say, is very different to what we observe when we do the same thing with eukaryotic nucleosome where you invariably get about 150 base pairs. So we believe the stochastic opening of these slinky-like hypernucleosomes is a really good low-tech way to permit access to the genome in absence of ATP-dependent chromatin remodelers or post-translational modifications. To date, these haven't been found in archaea. And we think, we, we think and we actually know from experiments that these structures also profoundly contribute to gene regulation. Now, in eukaryotes, uh, the ability to form open and closed hypernucleosomes has actually been retained as t and telomeres, as been shown by Daniela in the first talk. And I'll just share this with you. We these profound similarities to the left are our archaeal hypernucleosomes in their open and closed form, and to the right are Daniela's structure in the open and closed state. When we omit the histones for clarity and we superimpose those two structures, you can see the ridiculous similarities of these. And so this is really a very intriguing evolutionary link between archaeal and eukaryotic chromatin, uh, quite striking. And we don't quite know what to make of this yet. Now, back to archaea. Right now, we're really busy um, in investigating how common a phenomenon this type of chromatin arrangement is. Um, Archaea is a vast domain. They live in very diverse and extreme ecological niches. There's no environment on Earth where archaea have not been found. And unlike eukaryotic histones, these archaeal histones are not very conserved at all. And so we're having a lot of fun investigating various histone strategies depending on whether they live in sulfuric acid or whether they live at 95 degrees Celsius or whether they are cold loving, for example. There's also archaea that live in five molar salt. And the challenging challenges of having a protein bind to DNA at five molar salt um, are pretty easy to envision. So those are some of the ongoing stories in the lab. And, uh, but but I, I want to just point out that the expansion to four histones early in eukaryotic evolution allows nucleosomes to assume very complex regulatory functions that we do not uh, have in archaea. So in archaea, we have this single no-frills histones, no tails, no decorations. It forms a semi-stable, superhelical, slinky-like structures. And in eukaryotes, we've expanded to four histones and the ability to make more stable stable nucleosomes and more defined nucleosomes from these two building blocks. Um, in archaea, the polymerase is a bit slowed but not completely inhibited 
by uh, the existence of histones. There's no post-translational modifications, there's no remodelers, and they're entirely self-assembling. The price we have to pay for going to these more complex, more stable eukaryotic nucleosomes is that they profoundly inhibit DNA-dependent processes, and this is then used as a regulatory potential to tell RNA polymerases and DNA polymerases where to go and to target them. And this is really necessary because of the massive expansion of genome size, uh, presumably enabled by the existence of histones that were so kindly donated by the Archaea, we believe. However, we still don't know how we got from Archaea to eukaryotes. Where, where is the missing link? And this prompted us to go to bacteria, the last histone holdout, and this is work mostly done by Sean Larson in my lab. Um, bacteria are widely thought not to encode histones. They use different proteins to organize their very small genomes, um, and they strongly bend the DNA. But during the pandemic, Sean and our collaborators, uh, Antoine Hocher and Tobias Warnecke, when everybody was stuck on their computers doing bioinformatics, they did a wholesale search of histones in the entire domain of bacteria. And they surveyed about 18,000 bacterial genomes, um, and they found um, sporadic occurrence of histones in about 5% of all the genomes that they analyzed. And they were persistent, uh, quite persistent in several clades of bacteria. Uh, and what particularly caught our attention is the clade of Dello Vibrionata, um, shown here to the left, is this little guy sitting on top of a proper E. coli. So these, these bacteria have a very interesting life cycle that actually resembles that of a virus. They have a free swimming attack phase. In fact, they are the fastest swimmers known in the bacterial world. They swim around at one hell of a speed. They find themselves with juicy E. coli. They burrow into the periplasm, and they stay in the periplasmic state, um, where, they, um, where they then secrete, they, they secrete lipases, DNases, proteases into the prey bacterium. They digest it. They use the nutrient for non-binary fission. And then they replicate, and they thereby kill their prey. So they basically eat their prey from the outside, but from within the confines of the periplasm. So it's a very, very elegant and very efficient way to make a living. Um, these things, as I said, they have signal very highly expressed histones. I just want, so this whole life cycle takes about three to four hours. And I just want to share with you this video taken by the Lalu lab. You see the prey getting smaller and smaller as it's being digested. The Della Vibrio starts to septate, and then boom, the whole thing explodes. It's really one of my favorite movies. I could watch this all day. Um, because of this rather extreme effect, um, it's now being employed as a last resort antibiotic. Um, and um, it is a little scary, to be honest, to have these things bursting all of your bacteria. But I guess um, antibiotic resistance is a huge problem. And so there might be some life in this. All right, so what about the histone? Um, this bacterial histone is only about 20% identical to archaeal and human histones. Uh, proteomics analysis has shown that it is one of the most highly expressed proteins in this bacterium. Um, it is higher expressed than all of the other um, architectural proteins put together. And our crystal structure of this archaeal histone shows that it actually um, that it actually looks very similar to a eukaryotic histones. And you can see this in this overlay here. There are some subtle differences that I don't want to bore you with. The helix is a little, a little shorter, and it's a little less bent. Uh, but by and large, it really looks like a histone. More importantly, it also has on the top this very positively charged DNA binding ridge. Uh, you can see on the top are the archaeal in an electrostatic surface representation. On the bottom, you have our bacterial histone. Blue means it's uh, positively charged. And in archaeal histones and also in eukaryotes, it is this surface that binds the DNA to itself. 
And so we think it looks like a histone and it quacks like a histone, so for sure it must bind DNA like a histone. And much to our surprise, what we found is that these bacterial histones actually bind DNA end on in our crystal structure of it bound to DNA. So this was very strange, um, and, and of course, when you have crystal structures, you always want to have at least in solution uh, confirmation. So, um, so this is despite this DNA binding ridge. Uh, so uh, Sean devised a very elegant e experiment that is based on fluorescence resonance energy transfer, meaning you have two fluorophores um, that uh, emit a certain emit fluorescence at a certain wavelength only when they're in very close proximity. When you do this with archaeal histones that wrap the DNA around them, the two fluorophores come into close proximity and we can measure a fluorescence resonance energy transfer signal. When you do the same thing with our bacterial histone, you can add as much histone as you want. There is no fluorescence resonance energy transfer, meaning that this DNA remains strain, uh, straight and uh, hence unwrapped. Now, um, even, even more fun um, in the crystal lattice, this bacterial histone completely coats and protects the DNA, and so it kind of wraps itself around the DNA, forming, basically forms a sheath of proteins around the DNA. Uh, when you take off the histones and just color the phosphates according to which histone binds to them, you see every single phosphate on this DNA is completely covered and occluded from the surface, and uh, I think you will... Uh, appreciate it in this animation here where we have a space filling model of the histones that there's really very very little opportunity of any protein to get at this uh, to get at this DNA all right so in a way, we've kind of really shifted the paradigm here. We reversed histone logic. In bacteria, the DNA is on the inside, it is straight, and the histones wrap themselves around it. Whereas in eukaryotes and in archaea, all the other histones that we know to date, um, the histones are on the inside and they wrap the DNA around themselves. And so this has really profound implications for how much of the DNA is really accessible. Arguably, if you're a pioneer transcription factor, you can bind to the outside of the DNA in archaea and in eukaryotes, but there's no way you can access that DNA in bacteria themselves. So, does this structure exist in the cell? Um, that is, of course, always the uh, $500,000 question, and, and uh, we're, we're still working on this. These are not the easiest organisms to work with, but uh, the LALU lab has shown that the nucleoid, the bacterial DNA, is completely inaccessible in the attack phase. So when these guys swim around, finding themselves something to eat, uh, they don't really do a lot of transcription, they certainly don't do any replication, and so conceivably they can compact their genome in very confined spaces. Um, with a socket lab we could actually show that these histones are essential, um, or I should maybe rephrase saying that there's uh, no matter how hard we tried, we could not get any surviving knockout cells, which strongly indicates that these proteins are essential. And they are nucleoid associated, and we could show this by using uh, stained, citrine stained um, um, histones, and we could show that they remain associated with the bacterial nucleoid through the entire life cycle, nefarious life cycle of this bacterium. All right. so. Um, nuclear histone filaments, are they a curiosity or are they really a primordial use of histones? How general a phenomenon is this really? So for Dello Vibrio, uh, we're, we're busy looking at in situ nucleoid structures using cryo-electron tomography where you can actually open up the slice, open the cells, and then pretty much what Daniela has shown, trying to elucidate, elucidate what the structure of this uh, nucleoid really is and what the role of histones is. Um, we're also looking at in situ chromatin accessibility, attack, chip seek. Uh, we're looking at interacting proteins, what regulates their accessibility, how are they removed when we need to access as the DNA because arguably that is pretty difficult when you're encased in this sheath of proteins. And then we're also looking at unrelated histone encoding bacteria to investigate how general a phenomenon this really is. Um, why is this important? As I pointed out, 
if you have a bacterium that explodes other bacteria, that might be a good use for antibiotic development, especially for last resort antibiotic. And it really has generated a paradigm shift in our perception of histones as DNA organizing agents. So I've shown you that histones exist in all domains of life. And given that uh, the vast complexity of the, uh, of the tree of life, of all life on this planet, we've just randomly almost picked at some organisms and found really, really surprising uh, things. And so I think there's a lot more to be discovered. And we're really having a lot of fun uh, going down this rabbit hole of histones in non-eukaryotic organisms. Um, I will say that I'm actually a microbiologist by training. And so for me, it's a lot of fun to almost get back to my roots and start working on weird and strange organisms. Now. Um, I have the great fortune to live in a geographically beautiful area with lots of nature. Uh, so we get out a lot, we hike a lot, and, and I'm even more fortunate to have my husband and good hiking buddy who's here with me today to enjoy it with. Um, and I also have a really fabulous uh, group of people over the years and decades working with me with strong dedication to, to science. Um, this is just a, a, a snapshot of my group uh, at this current stage. I've had fabulous and generous collaborators who've been great fun to work with. And uh, I should also say that uh, I have a very strong uh, commitment to mentoring and to teaching. So when I started my own lab, I made the conscious decision to work at a teaching university, so I teach undergrads in metabolism and Krebs cycle and all those fun things. And, and I really get a lot of enjoyment of, of seeing my students and postdocs and undergrads and high school students grow and develop into scientists. And with that, I'm actually eight minutes early, and so you can thank me for that, because I'm sure you've all had an overdose of nucleosomes by now. And thank you all for coming. It's been a great pleasure to be here. Thank you. Oh.